Who here is alive? Okay, this is an easy question. Everybody should be raising your hand, or just about everybody here. Okay, thank you, hands down. Who here is blind? There might be one or two of you. And for you, I apologize that there are going to be parts of this presentation which will not be accessible, but I'll be narrating through them so that you can understand what's going on. Now, who here knows someone who is blind or is losing their sight? About one-third of you should have your, have your hands up, because about one-third of you, in fact, know someone who is blind or who is losing their sight, whether they've told you that or not. Ask your parents. Ask your grandparents. Talk to them. Blindness is widespread. It affects millions of people worldwide. The exact number of millions depends on exactly how you define blindness. For the purposes of this talk, blindness will mean that you can't walk without risking hitting something or someone. You can't see the food on the plate in front of you. You can't tell the color of your clothing or if your shoe has come untied. You, if your child or your grandchild hands you a piece of paper, you can't tell what the drawing is that they have made for you. Blindness is a devastating condition that can leave individuals isolated and withdrawn. It has staggering effects economically. In the United States, where we currently have almost full employment in the general population, in the blind population, unemployment runs at about 75%. Blindness has significant burdens on the family, both in terms of medical costs as well as everyday care costs. The total cost of blindness to society in the United States, including things like lost wages, is $3 billion a year. Interestingly, most of the causes of blindness are diseases of the eyes. I'm an engineer who's become a neuroscientist because of a passion for vision, and I find that very interesting. It's the sensors that have gone bad. Maybe we can fix that. The most common causes of blindness, in fact, are glaucoma, macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, and these three are the biggest. There are many other diseases, including some forms of cancer, but these are the biggest. A fourth cause of blindness, although not nearly as common, is trauma, specifically blast trauma that we find in modern warfare. We find it in both the civilian and the soldier. In areas where there has been war and land minefields have been left behind, Trauma rises in frequency and becomes a leading cause of blindness among children. In the developing world, this, the story is slightly different. And we have infection and cataract as the most frequent causes of blindness, but those have solutions. We know how to treat those, so we won't be talking about treating those individuals. Similarly, for congenital blindness, the brain is left without the normal experience of visual sight. And so it doesn't develop the way it normally would. And so no one in the field is talking about treating those individuals. Not yet. So what's the solution? We know the, when the eyes are no longer sensitive to light, as neuroscientists, we've discovered that the rest of the brain is OK. And as engineers, we know how to build cameras to capture moving images. And so we can just plug that information directly into the brain and vision. Steve Austin, Jordi LaForge, Neo, we're familiar with the idea from popular entertainment because of the technological simplicity it appears to have. The basic idea looks like this. We put a small camera, like the one in your mobile phone, into a set of goggles and send the video stream from that wirelessly to electrodes that we've implanted in the brain. And that provides restoration of function, or artificial sight, as we call it. We know how to build tiny cameras, we know how to build small computers, we know how to build wireless links, and we even know how to build brain electrodes. I'm both a scientist and an engineer, so it should just work. 
It sounds very simple, but that's the idea. The hard part is in translating the camera images into the language of the brain, the neural code, and delivering that translation in a safe way to the right parts of the brain so that it can be used to reconstruct images. The importance is in the details, and in the details we find challenges in technology, in biomedical engineering, and in science. Most of you are familiar with technology, but perhaps not so familiar with neuroscience, so here's a very quick introduction. This drawing is the underside view of a human brain where I've labeled the different stages of what's called the early visual pathway. It's called the early visual pathway because it's the first few stages in a very long chain of visual processing. Light enters the eyes and falls on the retina where it turns into neural activity. Most of the diseases that I mentioned that cause blindness interfere with that process and leave the eyes no longer sensitive to light. When the eyes are working normally, however, the signals fall through the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, as I've shown here, then through the optic radiation to the primary visual cortex at the back of the head. That's where conscious vision begins. From there, it moves on to other parts of the brain where things happen like recognizing people, places, or things. About 40% of the brain is devoted to vision. To restore sight to the blind, where the eyes are no longer functioning, we can think about putting signals from an electronic camera into any of these stages of the early visual system. Each stage, uses a, each stage uses a slightly different encoding, a slightly different neural language, but we understand most of those thanks to decades of work. We are, in fact, standing on the shoulders of giants. There is evidence going back 100 years that we can generate visual experience by stimulating the brain, different parts of the brain. Perhaps the first important attempt at a visual prosthesis was by Brindley and Lewin at the University of Cambridge in the late 1960s. They put 80 electrodes on the primary visual cortex surface in a brilliant bit of bioengineering that was well ahead of its time. They were able to use these electrodes to generate little points of light, little stars or small fuzzy circles, and we call those phosphenes. Phosphenes are visual experiences that are created without visual input. You see them, for example, when you go to sleep at night or before you go to sleep at night, when you close your eyes, those purple and greenish waves. You see them if you hit your head too hard. We call that seeing stars. Each of those stars is a phosphene. Well, you see them when a cosmic ray hits your retina, like for astronauts who frequently report phosphenes. So we think we can create small phosphenes, the pixels of artificial sight, by applying electrical stimulation to any part of the early visual system. Worldwide, there are about two dozen groups working on creating a visual prosthesis, and each of them take a slightly different approach. Many of them put electrodes in the eye. Some, like my group, put them in the LGN, and some put them in the primary visual cortex. But they all more or less follow the same idea. They use a man-made Im imaging system to apply patterns of electrical stimulation to restore sight. They also, more or less, all face the same big problem. The visual system is amazing, an amazingly experience, uh, detailed experience that it gives you. No one is talking about restoring normal vision. No one. All of these groups are creating devices that provide only very crude artificial sight. Better than blindness, but still very, very simple. Some groups like mine are aiming for a slightly higher quality visual prosthesis experience, uh, artificial vision, and so are taking slightly longer in development. Other groups are seeking to deliver a device as quickly as possible, and so have taken a lower resolution path. The hard part is not the technological design of the external apparatus, the camera, the eyeglasses, the stimulator, but in fact, 
the electrodes themselves and making sure everything is biocompatible. Since putting an electrode in a human is a hard thing to do, most of these groups rely on computerized simulations of artificial vision in order to answer questions about how well their device and their design will work. They use virtual reality technology and normal sighted individuals in order to do this. And these simulations are kind of fun, so I'm going to show you two of them as an, as an example. On the left side is a movie of a young woman from an ordinary camera. On the right will be a simulation of artificial vision with 500 phosphenes. Notice a couple of things. First, those phosphenes aren't one right next to the other like the pixels in your computer monitor. They're spread apart. That's because when we put fine wires into the brain to create electrodes for a visual prosthesis, we have to space them every so often in order to not damage the brain. We have to be clever about biocompatibility in order to maximize the number of electrodes that go in because each electrode produces one phosphine. Next, notice that if I had shown you just the right-hand image, you probably wouldn't recognize it as the face of a woman. Watch now as the animation begins. You can probably very quickly see that it is, in fact, the image of a woman's face. You see her eyes, her smile, you might recognize her. You can tell that it's a sunny day as she raises her hands against the, against the light. The brain does a marvelous, wonderful job of assembling that information. Let me play that again. The left image has about a million pixels. The right image, only 500 phosphenes. Now, 500 phosphenes won't give you normal vision, not by a long shot, but it's not bad it certainly would be useful, or at least it appears to be so. Here's another example from an experiment that we have run in the laboratory to test how well artificial vision can be used to read. There will be a simple sentence that'll, that will appear on the screen over three lines, and you'll hear the subject read the text out loud. Notice that the pattern of phosphenes will move as she looks at different parts of the sentence. Ten different kinds of flowers grow by the side of the road, she normally reads. Now, I bet no one could actually read that text, but she could. Remember with the first animation that I showed you, the jump between the static phosphenes and when they began to, to be animated? There's a similar jump that happens between watching someone else run an artificial vision simulation and running it yourself, because the phosphenes move with your eyes. Let me play that again. Ten different kinds of flowers grow by the side of the road, she reads. That woman was a typical average subject, and she could read easily and smoothly with 1,700 phosphenes. That means that anyone here with normal vision would probably also be able to read the same way if we put you in front of the simulation. There are two groups, one in Germany, one in the United States, who have created devices that have received approval for implantation in blind patients. Although these devices are very promising, they only provide very crude vision, not nearly as good as the two simulations I showed you just now. No one has built real devices like that yet. But all of the groups are working hard. In my laboratory, we are currently testing a system that uses 128 electrodes using two of the bundles I've shown here. And we have a newer version of the same thing that doubles that count to 250, or about half of the number of phosphenes that you saw in the first video. At the same time, we are designing the next generation system, which will have 1,000 phosphenes, and we'll start testing that 
in about a year. We aren't the only ones making good progress, and I expect to hear new exciting results from, field, from groups around the world in the next while. The message I want to leave you with, therefore, is as crazy as it might sound, we're able to put signals directly into the brain and go from zero to infinity, restoring sight to the blind. Thank you.